Won't you pray with me? Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, let them be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O God, for you are my strength and my redeemer. If it is not on my manuscript, I ask that you place it in my mouth so that these, your people, are able to hear a word from you. Holy Spirit, do thy will in this place. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The title for this morning's sermon is simply, Do the Right Thing. 35 years ago in the year, uh, back in the 1900s, in the year 1989, almost to the day, Spike Lee's movie, Do the Right Thing, debuted in the summer. It took place in Brooklyn's Bedford-Stuyvesant neighborhood, with all of the action happening on one block during a notorious heat wave in New York City. The movie's main conflict focused between Mookie, a young black man played by Spike Lee himself, and the Italian-American pizza owner, uh, pizza shop owner on the block named Sal. The unrelenting heat wave plays as the invisible actor that seemingly intensifies the deep racial divisions that happen in the microcosm of this one bed neighborhood. Even though the climax of the movie plays up on the traditional racial rifts between blacks and whites, Spike Lee's introduction of the Korean store owner on the block, as well as the ethnic conflicts amongst blacks and Hispanics, and in this case, specifically Puerto Ricans, highlights just how combustible race and ethnicity are in this country. The movie climaxes uh, when Mookie throws a garbage pail through the window of Sal's pizzeria. He does this right after the very graphic scene of one of the characters, Radio Rahim, has been killed, or should I say lynched, by the New York Police Department. The movie is clear in showing, showing that the interaction that the citizens had with the police, the movie is clear in showing that his death by a chokehold resulted in his feet being lifted up from the ground, hung like so many black men were in the decades following the end of Reconstruction. A riot on the block ensues after Mookie throws the garbage pail, but reconciliation does not. In the movie's closing credits, a quote from Martin Luther King and Malcolm X are shown, one advocating nonviolence and the other acknowledging that black folks have just as right as everyone else to bear arms in self-defense under the Second Amendment. And perhaps the most gut-wrenching in the movie is that after the showing of these quotes, there's a list of names of black folks killed either by the police or other citizens in racially motivated events. Now, this movie was inspired by the 1986 events at Howard Beach in Queens, where when three black men were attacked by white teenagers outside of a pizzeria shop. This resulted in the death of a man named Michael Griffiths, who after getting beating up badly, was hit by a vehicle trying to find help. Protests ensued with black marchers comparing the neighborhood to the then, South, to the then apartheid South Africa. Meanwhile, residents placed white power and go back to Africa signs on their yards and much worse language along with slurs. So even a month after the movie, Do the Right Thing debuted in 1989, August of 1989, Yousef Hawkins was killed walking to a party in the Bensonhurst neighborhood of Brooklyn when he and his friends were ambushed by a crowd of 30 white men. Later in 2005, Joseph D'Angelo of the Gambino crime family admitted that he had put out notice that no blacks were allowed in the neighborhood and it was later determined that the party that these young black men were invited to was actually a setup thanks to someone they had previously dated and the girl was trying to get back at the neighborhood boys. So I'm sure most of us have heard of Spike Lee or we've caught Spike Lee over the years. He's known for being quick witted and he rarely minces his words. And he said in the interviews over the years that most people pivot the movie's title on whether or not Mookie did the right thing by throwing the garbage pail through Sal's window. 
Spike Lee, being Spike Lee, goes on to note that he only gets asked that by white people who watch the movie and has never been asked that question by a black viewer. Now, in today's text, I was read today in Jeremiah 38, no one has to question whether or not King Zedekiah did the right thing, nor Shephatiah, Gedaliah, Jukal, or Pashur, the men who presumably ran to King Zedekiah with the idea to drop Jeremiah down the cistern. King Zedekiah washed his hands of the matter, and that seems to be a running theme amongst monarchs and regnal authorities and prefects to wash their hands of the matter and let the people choose and let them have their way with the prophet Jeremiah. Zedekiah stands by while God's prophet suffers at the hands of people who reject God's prophecies. The politics of it all. And here's some background. Zedekiah was not the typical king of Israel. In fact, as the last official king of Judah, Zedekiah had actually been installed by the Babylonians. The siege of Jerusalem, the one that we know most about, and the one that's taking place here in Jeremiah 38, also takes place in the book of 2 Kings around the 25th chapter. This was technically not the first time that the Babylonians had invaded Jerusalem. By this point, chronologically, Judah, and along with Jerusalem, was functioning as a vassal state for the Babylonians. However, they had been encouraged by the Egyptians, or rather encouraged by the Egyptians, Zedekiah launched a revolt against the Babylonians, which resulted in this final siege of Jerusalem that resulted in the destruction of Solomon's temple in around 586, 587 BCE. So when we get to this part of the story, Jeremiah is prophesying basically what anyone can already see. Jerusalem is about to be laid waste, and if they surrender, they will live. And if they stay, they will most certainly die. And at this point, Jeremiah's prophecy is no better than the late night televangelist from 1985 prophesying to you that, yes, 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 Catherine, yes, 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 I, I see it right now. Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow is Monday. Praise the good Lord Jesus. But even in that moment where death is imminent for all, they still choose to give Jeremiah a death sentence and lower him into a cistern. Now, I'm a city kid. I had to look up what a cistern is, especially how they function in the ancient Near East. A cistern in the ancient Near East was specifically created to catch rainwater that could later be used for agricultural purposes. And this was different than a well. A well relied on groundwater. And also, when it was dry, the cistern was often used as a dungeon. The Hebrew words used to describe what happened to Jeremiah seem to emphasize, seem to emphasize just how abject his circumstances were being lowered into a dry cistern. The text reads, now there was no water in the cistern, but only mud. And Jeremiah sank in the mud. Can you see him? Can you picture him? Being lowered down by a rope. The only light coming from the hole at the top and everywhere else were dark shadows. There could have been snakes or the animals hiding, seeking his demise. And as the rope lowers him to the bottom, he realizes that it is mud. And he sinks even further. It's as if you're at what you think to be your lowest point, only to find out you have not reached the bottom yet. Jeremiah in this passage demonstrates uh, that there can be a powerlessness in being prophetic. That to be prophetic means you are often subject to the whims of politics. We could flip back to the book of 1 Kings and see that Elijah encountered this same powerlessness as Queen Jezebel had him on the run. The same powerlessness that John the Baptist faced as the enemy of the state when the empire struck back, beheading him. This powerlessness is felt by those who fight tirelessly, tirelessly for housing justice, but the rents keep going up. 
This powerlessness is felt by climate activists who seem to be yelling into the void as nation after nation can't seem to get their act together. This powerlessness is felt by every citizen and resident of every country caught in a war zone, relegated to bullets and bombs flying overhead because of the politics of elected and sometimes unelected officials. Now, the New Revised Standard Version, the one read before us today, doesn't include the conjunction in its translation, but I looked it up. There is a Hebrew conjunctive vowel at the beginning of verse 7. We've talked about that before. We don't always know does it mean and or but, but the New International Version translates the conjunction as but which lets us know that there is something shifting that is about to happen in verse 7, something that is contrapuntal and contrary to what was said before. To put it another way, verse 7 could read, but Abimelech, the Cushite, a eunuch in the king's house, heard that they had put Jeremiah in the cistern, but Abimelech heard that they had put Jeremiah in the cistern. The way the writers of this text weave and narrate the story lets me and lets you know that while Jeremiah was sinking lower and lower into the muck and mire of a cistern serving as a dungeon that was destined to be his tomb, Abit Melik heard about Jeremiah. To put it another way, while Jeremiah was sinking, Abit Melik the Cushite was listening. Perhaps Spike Lee's insistence in telling the story that he found it fascinating that black people never posed the question, did Mookie do the right thing, reminds us that such a question should never be posed to victims of systemic oppression. There is no such thing as perfect victimhood, no matter how much one may try and conspire for it to be so. Martin Luther King said it poignantly that if a people are pushed to the point of rioting, that means that something very serious has gone wrong. As he said, riots are the language of the unheard. Rather, the question of doing the right thing is what ought to be posed to the people in power the people who have the power to do something about the situation. While Jeremiah was sinking, Ebed Melik was doing something within his power. He was listening. Doing the right thing, I would argue, starts with listening. Listening to the needs of others around you and listening to your own self. Being aware of what you can and can't do, what you can do on your own, and what you may need help on to accomplish. Listening that turns into action where action is needed. Because fact of the matter is not everything requires you or me to do something in the moment. Sometimes people just want to be heard. The ministry of presence Just sitting with someone and listening and being in their presence is all that is needed. But in the case of Jeremiah, at the bottom of a cistern sinking deeper and deeper into the quicksand like mud, a discerning ear isn't all that's needed. Deliverance is what is needed to save Jeremiah. So the image of Ebed Melik rallying some men to go back to the cistern with rope and tattered rags from the king's wardrobe is stunning to say the least, using clothes at the end of their usefulness, much like the king's reign in Jerusalem seems almost too on the nose. Not to mention Jeremiah's salvation is quite literally a human-made machination held together by spit and glue. It seems almost miraculous. And the drama of it all reads like a Greek odyssey. In fact, the last minute salvation and deliverance of Jeremiah actually has a name, Deus Ex Machina. Deus Ex Machina is the Latin phrase, God from the machine, which was borrowed from the Greek meaning the same thing. It functions as a plot device in which the author would somehow rescue the main character after having had written themselves into a corner. And it actually got its name from an actual machine built on a stage in which the character playing one of the gods would be lowered down onto the stage and intervene, thus changing the conclusion of the story. 
So it stands as a plot device in which a seemingly unsolvable problem suddenly has a resolution. It may or may not have to do with anything with the original plot, but is used to move the story forward. Can't you see Jeremiah sitting down in the cistern wondering, how in the H-E double hockey sticks am I going to get myself out of this? So Jeremiah, getting lifted out, plucked up, out even of the cistern, it isn't even necessarily miraculous even by Old Testament standards. This isn't the God of fire and smoke raining down manna. This isn't God opening up a highway through the middle of water. This isn't even God sending down fire and hail to confuse the enemy's army. But rather, the miracle is made material because someone in the king's household made the decision to do the right thing. The materiality of miracles happens in the everyday. The deus ex machina moments happen when everyday people see an injustice and use the power that they have to rescue, to pull up, to save those who have been left to die in the cisterns of oppressive and depressing conditions. Because the reality of the matter is that life has a way of lowering us into a cistern that we don't know how we ended up there, let alone how are we going to get out. Depression, anxiety, illness, <clears throat> a bad diagnosis, and bam, you find yourself sitting there in the muck and the mire only to find yourself sinking farther and farther and deeper and deeper into the mud. And then God has a way of sending an Ebed Melech your way. Perhaps in this moment as we grapple with the shifts in our politics, as we encounter empire, as we find new ways to adapt our existence to the vicissitudes of external forces. God is calling us to be like Ebed Melech and do the right thing. Stay always vigilant, listening for the clarion call to do what is right. It's only been seven days, it's only been one week since the landscape of our presidential election changed once again. In less than 24 hours of uh, President Biden's announcement, 44,000 black women hopped on a Zoom call to discuss organizing and rallying around the new candidate, Kamala Harris. And within 48 hours, 20,000 black men followed suit. And later in the week, Slightly more than 160,000 white women hopped on Zoom to organize, breaking the record for the largest Zoom call in history. Friends, this is the spirit of Ebed Melik. While there are those suffering in the pit of despair, there are those who listened to the plots of empire and decided to organize strategically against it so that the Jeremiah's of the world can once again see the glory and the salvation of God in the land of the living. Now, now I'm just going to drop this on you. The inside scoop is um, that, that these passages in Jeremiah were technically written down after the siege of Jerusalem by the Babylonians, because that's how some of our biblical scriptures came to be written. That is to say, in other words, isn't it a little convenient that the prophet, uh, for the prophet to know that Jerusalem was going to fall after the text was actually written and to know that there were going to be survivors as well. That's just my little bit, let y'all know I went by seminary for a little while, but that's neither here nor there, but I didn't want to say that. But still, the prophetic unction of Jeremiah's words carry weight to them. They shall have their lives, even as a prize of war, and live. As I said last week, empires come and go, dictators come and go, hard times come and go, and so do good times. 
Nevertheless, it's the spirit of Ebed Melech that is married to the prophetic anointing of Jeremiah that can transform the world into a better place and a better planet for all of us to inhabit. This is the union of humanity that God wants for all of us. And what is that? What is that that God wants for you, for me, for us? One of Jeremiah's most famous oracles to the Jews in exile is found in the 29th chapter. Verse 11, it was one of those ones that I memorized in Sunday school. For I know the plans I have for you, says God, plans for you to prosper and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And here's the shout. The word used for hope in Hebrew translates to cord, C-O-R-D, cord. And a cord is like a what? It's like a rope. Much like the rope Ebed Melik threw down to Jeremiah in the bottom of the cistern. So I'll admit to you, and I submit to you today, I'm not here to tell you the timeline of deliverance. I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know when it will happen. But I do know that if God is involved, cisterns are not meant for your demise, for they are only temporary as Jeremiah is being raised back up, pulled back up by hope, pulled back up by a cord. We, we've all been there, hanging on for dear life, hanging on by a thread. But the good news is that if you are hanging on by a thread, then that means the thread is strong enough to keep you from falling back down into the pit. So I submit to you today, keep hanging on. Keep hanging on even when the means of liberation look tattered and worn out like the rags Jeremiah put under his arms as a harness. Keep on hanging on when it seems like the rope or the thread isn't strong enough. Keep hanging on even when the awful breaking news comes across your TV screen or in your phone. Why? Because we remember the words of the prophet, the words of Jeremiah. They shall have their lives and live. So live, live fully. God has smiled on you and your life. Live so that you may embrace the spirit of Ebed Melech and always do the right thing.